2020 was a challenge and I realize that is a gross understatement, but it was, it was so weird and just strange for everybody everywhere. So why not have this freak early season snowstorm out in Colorado? You know, why not just have that be this intermission between the acts of this otherwise historic hurricane season? So this is a good lesson in lake effect snow, isn't it? Yes, it is. What are we looking at? Well, on a smaller version than what they would deal with in the Great Lakes because this lake is much smaller. Um, you have wind blowing from in that direction down the lake to the shoreline, right? which is producing all this steam. So not long after Laura, I decided I wanted to do something different, kind of get away from these hurricanes for a little bit. And so I was joined by a longtime friend of our project, Tim Bruno who would assist me out there in Denver and the surrounding area for this early season snowstorm. All right, we have a winner. Look at that. Crowdfunded data. As I like to do quite often, I wanna test our equipment outside of hurricane situations whenever possible. And this snowstorm out in Colorado was a great opportunity to do so, especially these kestrels that seem to do pretty well during Laura. I wanted to test them kind of separately outside of the camera boxes, just kind of put them out there by themselves. So that's what Tim and I did. We set up a few of them between the Denver airport and vicinity, out along I-25 and eventually down to Colorado Springs and that area where we actually got to meet up with a colleague of one of our crowdfunding supporters. It was definitely surreal the day that Tim and I landed in Denver the temperature was close to 100 degrees, if not higher, depending on where you were. There were these wildfires that kind of made the sky this weird, like Mars-like look to it. I mean, it was just so strange and it fit in with everything else that was strange and unusual about 2020. Uh, but we got to work, we set out these cameras and the next day the cold and the snow moved in. One of the more interesting aspects of the trip out there was how the cold air drained across this local reservoir. The surface temperature of the water, Tim and I estimate, was about 75 degrees. And then you've got this 30 degree air pouring across, wicking up the moisture, it made it you know, real steamy out there, and gave it this nice eerie look. Without a doubt, the coolest part of the entire trip out here, dude, this is it. Oh look, there's a shadow, you got a fog shadow. That's so cool. Colorado afforded me an opportunity to kind of take a break from the siege of hurricanes. It was nice, but it was time to get back to it. And where else but the coast of Mississippi once again for a very difficult to predict Hurricane Sally. So Greg, dude, GFS bombs it out, 12Z. I mean, I'm, like, I'm concerned. What a completely different day than yesterday, wouldn't you say? It, it aligned, um, and the conditions were always right, but sheer relax, what little there was, it's going to town over 90 degree water. And how quickly things changed just from yesterday. And it's very 2020, isn't it? Right. Just oh, how yeah, things really, are going. No kidding. So, Originally, yeah, and people don't may not remember this, that New Orleans was under the gun at the beginning. And then, as time went on, and the GFS, like I said, that year did excellent. It picked up on it faster than the Euro and other models. It was showing that little bit more of a turn to the right. And I think that had to do with the model seeing that it was slowing down and it was going to stall. So I think the model did finally start picking up on it. But for me personally, what made it difficult was, of course, I want to go, but my, again, my wife is an on-air meteorologist in Biloxi, our home's in Gulfport. I mean, it seemed like every two, three weeks we had some sort of system in the Gulf, which made us all on guard, dealing with scheduling, sleep deprivation, plus Greg and I just closed on our new home, so we had to move in all of our new furniture, all of our stuff, and that was stressful, doing that in between systems. Yeah, there's no doubt that it was definitely starting to wear on all of us, but we had no time to waste. We had a lot of equipment to get set up and you know have that ready for whatever happened. 2012, same, obviously it's the right. same thing that Dad Davis is in. Awesome, and we got our little pressure sensor right there. The very famous George Manaman. George is always great to work with, but I think even he was getting a little tired of seeing my face that year down there at the marina in Gulfport. But that being said, 
the collaboration that we do have is extremely important because it just makes it a lot easier for us to set everything up and get ready for whatever might be coming their way. All right, uh, set up two cameras here. Thanks to Greg and Brent and Mike. After I fell off the ladder, we get back on the horse. Yeah. And look at the result. Took one for the team. Yeah, we got two cameras. And that's a look east down Highway 90, west down Highway 90. At this point, it does look like the Mississippi coast is going to have some pretty significant impacts from Sally. And as such, there is a hurricane warning. There's a storm surge warning in effect as well. Potentially up to 11 feet of surge could come rolling in there. And this is concerning not only to us as we try to set up all of our equipment and get ready for this event, but also for the locals and especially for those who have boats at the nearby Gulfport Marina. You know, for them to evacuate their boat is costly in, in just in dollars. They've got to make, they've got to get out, you know, they've got to leave their job for a certain period of time. they got to pay for fuel that they otherwise might not be paying for at that particular point in time. they got to get a crew, they got to get somebody to help them move these boats. These aren't necessarily boats that you can move by yourself. So there's just a whole big picture to that, which aggravates tenants in this marina because they're saying, well, if we just had floating piers, we'd be fine. And I'm saying, well, if we had floating piers, uh, they're not going to be here when you get back. That's why we don't have floating piers. So we were watching it as it was organizing uh, near the Bahamas, between the Bahamas and Florida. You know, it was gonna, we knew it was going to cross the peninsula and it was going to come up into the north central gulf. Just how strong and exactly where it was going to go was going to be a challenge because we knew the steering currents were going to collapse by the time it got up towards the north northern gulf coast. You just feel sick and I can't lie, sometimes I almost feel guilty. As a meteorologist that's fascinated by this stuff, I'm fascinated by something that could ruin people's lives. And it's, sometimes it, it is hard to kind of find a balance with that. One of those places that we went to was Dolphin Island, and I guess it was social media. The and again, we're seeing more and more what social media, what doors social media can open to us. And some of these places that we went to, nobody was there. The the, the property owners would respond to Mark saying, "Oh yeah, I have a you know a a, a home on second row or front row." Um, and it is the, here's the address and you can go there and you know just climb walk up the steps we were given permission long distance to use their their house as as a, a staging area for for a camera or two all right we got a GoPro set up 36 hour runtime really nice people here at lucky enough Dolphin Island Alabama this could be ground zero. I mean, obviously it's hard to predict exactly, but regardless, this area is going to get hit hard. I mean, just look right. at right now. Yeah. Look at the white caps and the water's already coming up. Uh, we have a strengthening hurricane, 100 mile an hour Cat 2, and at this point I don't see anything that's going to stop it from getting to a Cat 3. So we've got equipment now set up from Mississippi over into Alabama, and of course this includes our weather station that we put on top of the bridge that goes out to Dolphin Island. And so far, everything is working fantastic. It really is. But Sally itself is being very, very fickle. It is slowing down, it is intensifying, and this has a lot of people very concerned. The National Hurricane Center, the local forecasters in the area, and the biggest reason behind that concern is you've got Mobile Bay, and of course Mobile directly in the path of this hurricane. So obviously in a Sally scenario, slow moving, you know, the heavy rainfall potential in an urban area combined with the potential storm surge at Mobile Bay certainly could have been a, a very significant uh, hurricane for the city. Sally continued to keep us all guessing and now it looks like the worst of the conditions are going to be east of Mississippi, maybe even as far east as the Florida Panhandle. So Mike and I continued to work as fast as we could to set up as much equipment as we could. We go down to Gulf Shores, we go to Fort Morgan, we even put a camera system right along Highway 90 itself going across Mobile Bay.
early on, I thought it was gonna go beast mode. The day before, it had that kind of shrimp look to it. It had to look like it was just about to go under rapid intensification. But then that morning when we woke up, we're like, it's got some dry air in it, looks a little sheer, it looks a little lopsided. So I knew a hurricane was gonna make landfall and we headed towards Gulf Shores and that area of Alabama. But I'll be honest, I was not expecting, you know, nearly a category three hurricane. This is Greg Norshow with HurricaneTrack.com. I'm here with Brant. We're heading east on I-10 towards Mobile, likely going to cross the bridge and head on the eastern half of Mobile and maybe even continue more east, depending on the exact track of Sally. With Greg and his friend and colleague Brant heading down to Gulf Shores to cover the landfall in person there, and considering the fact that we already had a live cam there ourselves, I had an idea, and that was based on the fact that it looked like there could be potentially historic river flooding inland away from the coast after Sally makes landfall. So Mark all of a sudden decides that, well, maybe we should focus our attention to inland flooding. So that's what we did. Why am I here? Well, this is forecast to rise 21 to a level of 21.8 feet because of all the rain from Hurricane Sally. And I want to capture that. I mean, that's significant from where it is right now, you can see. And uh, freshwater flooding is a real problem in hurricanes, tropical storms. So this could flood pretty bad. One of the reasons why I wanted a camera here to capture the flooding along the Fish River is that I figured a majority of this was gonna happen during daylight hours because again, Sally looked like it was gonna make landfall at the coast during the nighttime. It's not just the wind and the storm surge. So we'll see, that could be pretty dramatic. Fish River here in rural Alabama could be very dramatic. We shall see. Yeah, we tried to set up the live camera system there, but there just wasn't enough outgoing bandwidth. We're kind of out in rural Alabama, so we figured, hey, let's turn to the trusty backup system, the GoPro cam. All right, Mark Suddeth here, 319 p.m. Central Time at the Fish River in Alabama. Looking back at what we know now about what this camera would capture there along the Fish River, and considering the success of these GoPros that we've been using since Mexico Beach there with Hurricane Michael, I think it is truly remarkable what these cameras, but maybe more so the little yellow boxes, these Pelican cases that we use that protects the camera, that protects the battery. These are allowing us to capture things that we normally wouldn't get to see. And I think it's just an incredible example of using technology to solve a problem. All right, so can you loosen it? Because I need the straps to go right here. I need them definitely to go high. Not long after we set up the camera there along the Fish River, I got word from a good friend of mine that works for Florida Emergency Management that the Perdido River over in Florida could also potentially flood to historic levels. So I told Mike, why don't we head up that way and continue covering the potential for this major inland flood risk. He starts relying on uh, intel that was being fed to him, again, through social media and the other um, sources that he has and that helped him, us, get to where we needed to go. All right, here we are. This is the Perdita River, expected to reach 26 feet. Wow. And you can see back here, that's where we've got the two cameras. One's looking at the river, the other one's looking back towards the houses and stuff. Perdita River here, Florida, Alabama line. A lot of movie scenes ran through my head as we were driving into some of these places. And uh, you really don't know how you're gonna be accepted or not accepted. I really do think that the people up there appreciated the fact that we were back in their area covering the story there because you know, they get it. They know what the river can do. They're well aware of the potential flooding that's coming. They're starting to evacuate. And I think maybe, just maybe seeing us set up those cameras motivated them even more. Thank you.
So I was with my good friend Brant Beckman, and he works in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, a uh, former student of mine who's a broadcast meteorologist, so he was there with me. And it's always good to have someone that understands, you know, what you're about to go through. He was with me and Irma, so he had some experience. And uh, we rode out together. Um, just by kind of randomness, there was a lot of other chasers. I saw Reed Timmer out there. I saw Mike Tice out there. I think Morgaman wasn't too far away. So there was a whole bunch of chasers out there. Uh, we're real close to the beach there in Gulf Shores, which for me, that was the first time I've been in Gulf Shores since uh, pre-Ivan. And I was shocked how built up it was since then. And we found a really good parking garage, a safe spot. This is Greg Nordstrom with HurricaneTrack.com. We're here in Gulf Shores, Alabama, awaiting the approach of Hurricane Sally. Um, you know, we knew we were going to be safe. Brant was doing live cut-ins for his station, um, so we were doing some feeds. And I don't know how, but we actually had internet pretty much all night long, all the way to the morning. harder uh, it was harder on, on my family that went through it through through the eye wall I, I didn't go through the eye wall I was at work I was west of the eye wall my family uh, endured the eye wall I, I, we, I, I've told the story and I hope she doesn't mind that my mom who is a hurricane pro hurricane veteran went through Ivan the eye went right over my parents house at Ivan you know they had damage they were fine you know Sally took almost the identical track just took a few more hours to get through the area and when I got a text from my mom about 5 a.m. that morning, like, when's it gonna be over? I knew this one struck a different chord with her. I think it was the prolonged nature, the sound. And the fact that you can't see at night either. You know, you got trees falling. Uh, you don't know what the damage is to the house, if any. There's a lot of things going on. This is Greg Nordstrom with HurricaneTrack.com. In our location, we're on backup generator. Also across the street, they are as well. We're starting to see power flashes in the distance as the majority of the island has gone pretty much pitch dark here. The northern eye wall of Hurricane Sally is approaching slowly. Mike and I decided that we would stay in Gulfport. We just felt like it was probably a little bit too dangerous to try to get down to Gulf Shores, certainly Pensacola or Orange Beach especially considering that Sally was strengthening very quickly. We could see that on radar. And I mean, besides, we had Greg and Brant. They were in Gulf Shores. The eye wall was starting to move in. We had our camera down there, the live cam right at the waterfront. And as it turns out, the eye went right over that location. Here's our car covered in clothes. Pretty crazy. What an experience, though. We're in the eye of Hurricane Sally. Pretty much flat calm now. NHC called it about 30 minutes ago. It's about 5.30 a.m. At 5 a.m., we we're officially in the center of the eye. Landfall point, exactly where we were. We nailed it, did a great job. Incredible experience, but now it's time for a nap. I just remember sitting there kind of a little bit in shock and talking to Mark, like, can you believe what this thing's doing? Because they usually, when they're stalling in shallow water, do not do that. That is rare to see a hurricane that's stalling in shallow water intensify the way it did. I've never seen that, honestly. Not long after daybreak, Mike and I left Gulfport. We made our way east and crossed Mobile Bay, finally catching up with the slow-moving hurricane as it was traveling across Baldwin County. The rain bands, they were very intense, and this really, I think, quickly showed us how fast the inland flood threat was becoming a major problem. Our live camera along the Perdido River was working, even though it was intermittent. I mean, you gotta remember, this thing's in a hurricane. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, and yet it's working, and because it was working, we were able to see that the water level from the Perdido was rising hour after hour, no doubt creating a significant threat to life and property. You know, emergency manager did a great job trying to get people in more vulnerable locations out. I think they did a fantastic job. We had countless water rescues across the area, probably in the thousands, 
Uh, we lost count. So obviously Sally's impacts along the immediate coast were substantial. Pensacola, Orange Beach, those areas really hammered by this rapidly strengthening hurricane right before landfall. But the massive flooding that was now starting to take place, that quickly became a major secondary story across western Florida and portions of southern Alabama. Sally was one of these storms that just came in and just stalled, just didn't want to leave. And what does that mean? That means it just starts dumping rain. And we've been there, done that and several times in North Carolina, Bonnie and most recently Florence. And we just kept saying it over and over again, man, these, these, these people are, I hope they're ready for a big flood because it's coming. Now, of course, I was wondering, how is the GoPro doing? I mean, we can't see it live. It does not stream live. It, it only records on this little micro SD card inside the GoPro. Um, we'd have to wait. We'd have to wait several days until we went back and picked it up. We did, and sure enough, everything worked. All right, Mark Suddeth here, 319 p.m. Central Time at the Fish River. It's interesting because we see a police officer come by, I think it was around one o'clock in the morning to check on things. Not much was happening, but as we approach daybreak, it becomes an entirely different story as the extremely heavy rain begins to take its toll and the Fish River is obviously leaving its banks and starting to flood the area significantly. As the morning wears on, we can see that the water keeps on rising, but it's not just here at the Fish River. It's all the different streams and creeks and rivers across Western Florida, Southern Alabama. But the Perdido in particular, because we're seeing it on the live cam, was really kind of haunting because the water level had now pretty much reached the point of the camera lens itself. And you have to remember, we had placed the camera box in a tree some 10 feet above the ground. Sally was fierce, there's no doubt about it. The storm surge at the coast, the wind damage that we saw, the ongoing inland flooding, I think a lot of people really were taken by surprise at just how substantial these impacts were. Especially in a rare event like a Sally, where you're getting 20 to 30 inches of rain and flooding's gonna happen in areas that don't normally see it. How do you envision it? How do you prepare for it? And think about this. I'm someone that's been in 24 of these. I'm a meteorologist who studied this my whole life. Imagine, you know, you're just a normal person that lives there. It can be mentally challenging to get through these hurricanes, um, especially if you have your wife and kids or family or pets. This was a very challenging event for us, no doubt. You know, it was part of what was already a very challenging year for everybody. But in the end, the technology came through once again. It allowed us to see the impacts from Sally from many different vantage points. We had wind data, we had pressure data. I was also very grateful that Greg and Brant went down to Gulf Shores to intercept the eye there. We got to see things from their perspective. But I think when it's all said and done, the most intriguing aspect of the whole mission was the GoPro footage there from the Fish River. So these GoPro cams that we have been using to augment our live coverage of hurricanes and other severe weather events have truly proven themselves time and again. We think about the first time we used them back in 2018, that was Hurricane Florence over in Surf City to capture the storm surge there. Then we move on to Michael in uh, Mexico Beach and East Point, Category 5 Hurricane Michael. That was extraordinary. 2019, Dorian up along the North Carolina Outer Banks. Now, in 2020, this GoPro cam is gonna show us something. It's gonna witness something through its lens that we have truly never seen before. When Mike and I set up that camera, the GoPro camera there at this park, it was called Bohemian Park, we didn't have any idea of exactly what was going to actually happen. The forecast was for about a 27 foot crest of the Fish River. So we figured, well, we better at least put the camera 10 feet or so above the ground. And that's what we did, but little did we know that not only would it record this historic flood, but the camera itself would go under several feet of water.
The first time that I saw the video from the GoPro cam along the Fish River, I thought, this must be what it's like to drown. And as terrible as that sounds, it is absolutely true. The water level is coming up. You can't see over the top of it eventually. It puts the box under water. Things are bumping into that box. It finally gets completely submerged. And I thought, wow, this is truly remarkable, showing once again just how important this technology is. Sally humbles us as forecasters from the intensification standpoint. We have a lot to learn when it comes to intensity forecasting. And I, it's so important for the public to know that. You know, we're, we're open and honest about it. We don't have all the answers when it comes to the intensity of, of a hurricane and exactly what is driving it and the sudden change that sometimes occurs. Most of these people go back generations, so they know about hurricanes. They're, you know, their grandfathers, their grandmothers, their fathers, their mothers have told them these stories, you know, going back from Katrina or even back to the 47 hurricane or hurricanes that even predate that. So this is part of the culture. It's part of living there. Um, if you live, you know, in Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama on the coast, you know you live with hurricanes, just like if you live in the West Coast on the San Andreas Fault, you know you live with earthquakes. This is part of where you live. Mike and I were pretty much done with Sally, but the season was far from done with us. We looked at the tropical weather outlook map as we were wrapping things up, and we had like Teddy and Vicky and Wilfred and I think Alpha had formed. We were already in the Greek letters. It was just going by so fast. And now we had Tropical Depression 22, soon to become Tropical Storm Beta, the second name, into the Greek letters. So that meant that we had to head to Texas. Beta would be the first U.S. tropical cyclone to have a Greek letter, if that makes any sense, and uh, Mike and I would be there for it. You know, it was not much more than really uh, a kind of a nuisance for this part of Texas. Certainly it was a novelty, that's for sure, and I think more than anything it really underscored how bizarre the 2020 hurricane season really was. Freeport, Texas, walking through the water, We've met some really good people through our contact, Jeff Lindner up at Harris County Flood Control District. Now we have a camera permanently mounted. Fantastic. Show us what's happening with Tropical Storm Beta and then any other weather, weather that they get here in the off season. Sally and Beta kept Mike and me on the road for the better part of probably two weeks, maybe longer. I think certainly the longest that I have been away from home doing my work. The Gulf Coast is reeling from these hurricanes, especially Laura, Category 4 Hurricane Laura just a few weeks before. The country is in the grips of this pandemic. The social and political turmoil are really starting to boil over now. We're just thinking, can we get out of September? maybe get into October and find some kind of a break from all of these hurricanes, but unfortunately, we weren't even halfway there. 